Hello and welcome to another edition of Resource PNG. Exploration is happening in almost every part of PNG. Central Province is no different. We talked to Laris Energy, an exploration company that is doing much work within the province. We will also talk to another petroleum exploration company, Kina Petroleum, about their work in PNG. And a process that goes hand in hand with exploration project is social mapping. We talked to an expert in this field, anthropologist Dr. James Weiner, about what goes into this very important process. To start off, we have that interview with Lars Energy Limited's managing director, David Williams. He details the exploration project in what is termed the Taurus Basin, located within the central province. Good evening, viewers. With me tonight is David Williams, who's the managing director of Lars Energy. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. So tell us about Laris Energy. What is it and what's your, what exactly do you do? Look, Laris is a new company. We've only been around for a bit over two and a half years. And principally, we were set up to take a petroleum prospecting tenement that we have in Papua New Guinea and to take that forward um, to see if there's some oil and gas there. Um, and so in that period of time, we've been looking to, to raise some money, um, which we've done through private, private people. Um, and develop our exploration work as far as the, the uh, license in Papua New Guinea is concerned. So are you able to give us a background on what you're doing in Papua New Guinea? Well look, f we've gone into an area that everyone has said over the years there is not oil and gas. Um, and, you know, we, we disbelieve that and we've gone and looked at the available information um, and that encouraged us. So we, we looked at some of the old data, we looked at what we could understand about what had gone on um, with the geology of the area, and we thought, hey, you know, there looks like this is the same as up in the highlands, but someone has thrown a mantle of rubbish over the top. So it's like a buried highlands. So since that time, we've, we've pulled that information together and then we've gone out to get our own targeted data. Now, we do that by a method of seismic, and it's, I describe it to people in the area of a bit like a mobile phone, and the waves go off and goes to another person and comes back. Well, we do the same. We simply send it down in the ground and it talks to whatever the structures are down there and comes back. So, you know, first of all, in doing that, we established our base down in the area. So we're, we're east of Port Moresby, we're down the, the peninsula, and our main base we've established down at Cupiano. And so we've gone and we've focused our work initially in the deeper water to the south of the Ribbon Reef, and then more recently on the other side of the reef, just to try and find these pictures. And, and the results are very encouraging. So you're based in, central, in the central province of Pop, um, Papua New Guinea, yes? Yeah, for we, now? We, we decided that most people are based in Port Moresby, um, for, I suppose for obvious reasons, the logistics are getting to where their areas are, are pretty hard. But we thought, no, we're about getting closer to the people down in our region. Um, you know, people have not had exploration down in that central province area. Uh, and so we felt we needed to be accessible to people as we were going through and doing things that they had never seen before. So as I said, we, we established our base in Cupiano. Uh, it's been very well received by the people down in that region because we are that much closer to them. All right, now that you're down there, do you actually have, uh, do you offer employment to the people there in terms of what you're doing? Yeah, what, what we try and do is that we, obviously in, in and around the base at Cupiano, we're employing people, but our exploration activities go right out through the, through the uh, central province and beyond. I mean, we, the tenement itself is over 16,700 square kilometres. Half of that is on land and, and clearly extends all the way from Port Moresby all the way down to um, you know, almost to, to Milne Bay, but not quite. So there's a big area we cover and there's a big area that we need to do exploration. So our, our policy is, first of all, to try and site our work near villages. And then having done that, then we try and give work to the people in the village on a fair basis. So we try to spread the work around, not to concentrate too much in one area, not to concentrate too much with one group of people, to spread around. We can't give jobs to all, but we're, what we're doing, we're trying to do as fairly as possible. And you're also dealing with the Taurus Basin. Are you able to tell us a 
Yeah, what well, they, I suppose no one knew the Torres Basin was there until we came along. Um, everyone, I think, felt that the, the, uh, the basins, at least on the southern part of PNG, ended at the, at the eastern edge of the Papuan Basin, so in the Gulf of Papua. Well, what we now know from the, the seismic work that we've done and the studies we've done, that uh, the area um, uh, to the, from the edge of the, of the Gulf of Papua, from the shallower part of the Gulf of Papua, through across to the east, is a whole new basin. And that's a basin that no one has looked at before. And, and that basin, as we now know, has its own, what they call with oil and gas, its own kitchen. Sounds odd, but that's where you cook up the oil and gas and it comes to the surface. And that's very important as far as having a successful uh, and prospective oil and gas area. So basically you're doing exploration then? Very much e exploration at this stage. So it, it's first of all finding, um, you know, is there evidence of, of oil and gas in the area? Uh, and are there areas that will trap it? Um, oil and gas is always trying to get to the surface. So you need to find something almost like an inverted uh, coffee cup if you can that will trap it. So, so the seismic is looking at the structures below the surface. It can tell us so much. It can tell us, um, you know, are there um, what look like coals there, so a source of the oil and gas? Um, are there sands there, something to hold them? And are there likely to be a seal that's going to stop them escaping? So that's what we do. We look at that first, but then you need to get into drilling. And so that's the next stage of what we're wanting to do after we've, we've done some more seismic work onshore is to then drill some wells onshore. And then that will give us the understanding and, and, the, and the clear evidence of what oil and gas is down there, what quantities, what consistency. So are, am I allowed to ask you what kind of a timeline are you looking at before drilling starts? Yeah, well look, we're, we're trying to move very quickly. Um, and, when, and I often sort of pinch myself when I think of how long we've been at it. And in, in reality, we've only been working on this in a in a very proactive way for about 12 to 18 months. And we're dealing with a whole new basin, which no one has drilled in before. In fact, no one has done any exploration work in before. Um, and, and every time we do work on it, it's been very positive and, and very successful. So, you know, the plan is, uh, and we have planned to do, first of all, some onshore seismic, um, which we're hoping to do in the, in the, uh, the last part of this year. Um, and then that will give us some targets. It will give us some places to, to then go and drill. Um, so our current plan is then to, to drill a number of wells onshore to the west of Cupiano uh, in early next year. Okay. Now, and then that will give us uh, whether there's oil and gas there. Okay, so what's your development plan going forward? Well, that, that, that's, that's the immediate development plan. We'd also like to shoot some more of the um, shallow water onshore seismic that we shot in February. So in and around the structures we've already identified, in and around the, the reefs. And, and we use a technique there and we use an operator there that um, is very well regarded uh, in Australia for actually shooting over reefs, let alone around them. Um, so we'd like to shoot some more of that just to, to, uh, to get some more understanding of some of the other targets we've already identified. And then the structures that we have identified in the deeper water, um, and we haven't talked about those, but they are huge. And, and they're huge, but the, the costs of the well are very high. So we know that therefore th this is a, an area that we need to bring along a major oil company as a partner, or, or oil companies as a partner. Because what we're sitting on in this area, what we know that we're sitting on in this area, is not just the first part of an LNG project, it's an entire LNG project. There is, looking at the structures that we already know, sufficient gas there not to deal with you know, the, the PNG LNG facility in its current form, but that three times over. Right. So Mr Williams, what would be your message to potential and returning investors? Um, Look, the thing that I suppose has surprised me to a certain extent um, is about how good it has been to work in PNG. Uh, particularly the people down in our region, uh, they've been fantastic, very supportive. I mean, PNG is a place to do business. I, 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 mean, I get caught up in the buzz and the excitement that's going on there at the moment. I know a lot of the companies that are looking at that region. 
PNG is a place you can do oil and gas business at the moment, uh, and PNG, I am sure, will be the next major centre for LNG in Southeast Asia. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams, for your time. Thank you very much for your time. There was an interview with Lars Energy's Managing Director, David Williams. After the break, we talked to another exploration company, Kina Petroleum. Thank you for staying with us. Kina Petroleum Limited has exploration projects in Central, Gulf, Western and Medang provinces. We spoke to the Managing Director Richard Schroeder about what they are doing in PNG. So just tell us a little bit about Kina Petroleum. Good, yeah, it'd be a pleasure. Uh, Kina Petroleum is a very young company. Uh, it was floated on the 19th of December in, uh, on the Sydney and the Port Moresby stock exchanges. It's a PNG registered company and uh, a good half of our, our uh, uh, shareholders would be PNG residents, PNG nationals. Uh, we raised about uh, 12.3 million in December, but we were actively drilling at that time. And uh, we'd already spent 5 million before we'd raised a cent. So we've gone through quite a, a tough time. It was a very tough time to raise money in the marketplace but we did get the support we needed to, to float. And since then we've gone forward with uh, the exploration activities where we've had the success in PRL 21. But I will say that um, PNG is an excellent place to explore because you do get support both financially and the, the rewards are good there too. Right. So we understand that your aim is to build a successful and sustainable oil and gas company. Um, and the returns and to have original focus and have strong returns for your stakeholders. So. What kind of strategies have you got in place to achieve this? Well, we started as a pure exploration company. They were the uh, PPLs that we had in the Papuan Basin down the southeast near Interoil's activity and discovery at El Cantaloupe. We had a block up near Medang and a couple of other blocks down near Port Moresby. When we initially went to the market in the beginning of uh, 2011, the market just said to us, very interesting, but in these conditions, you really need to have something that's got more near production potential. And we were very fortunate uh, towards the end of 2010 that PRL5 was put onto, back onto the market for bids, and we aggressively bidded, bid for it, and we were successful in getting 15% of the PRL. So where's PRL 21 located? PRL 21 is located very close to Kiunga. It's up the Fly River and it's uh, about 90 kilometres from the uh, Indonesian border in the foreland of PNG in quite gentle country. But uh, it's still quite remote and requires full helicopter access at this point in time. The, the operator, the company that operates on our behalf is Horizon Oil. That's also an Australian listed company. Okay. So how does your sustainable um, feature in your strategy? How, how does sustainability feature in? Well, we'd like everything to be sustainable, of course. But uh, what we extract from the ground, of course, has a given life. And what we have discovered here will have a certain life at a specific price. We have found liquids and gas, and we would hope to sell those liquids at $100 a barrel. And we will extract, say, uh, 50 or 60 million barrels from the fields at that price. When those uh, liquids, when the oil is exhausted, then we will move into the gas phase. So it's a two-phase process. Now, if the gas or the oil price was to increase from $100 to $200, then we could most probably extend the production period. But at the end of the day, it's not in our stakeholders' interests for us to do things that are not profitable. And uh, the sustainability of this will really depend on how long we can maintain production at a profit. All right, so what is the petroleum prospecting licenses? I think you've got several in the country. Petroleum prospecting license, licenses 
uh, PPL337 near Madang, PPL338 and 339, very close. They completely surround Interoil's elk antelope and Triceratops discoveries. And then we have PPL340 down near Port Moresby. They are petroleum prospecting licenses. They are issued to us by the government for six years and they are issued on the basis that we undertake certain exploration work during that period. At the end of the six years, we are entitled to keep 50% of the blocks, provided they are in good standing, and we relinquish 50% back into to the government, who then reissues them to other explorers. Okay. So how is PNG's economy conducive um, to the growth of the petroleum industry? Well, it's, uh, it's actually two answers to that. The, the economy is helping in that uh, it's providing investment in a company like ours. There are people that want to invest because there's growth in the economy and they like what we're doing. Uh, it's providing services now that weren't here previously that are good in terms of helping us grow the company. Um, but in terms of the... Uh, the most important factor at the end of the day isn't so much the economy. I mean, you could have Hong Kong's economy, and I wouldn't be here sure. if you don't have oil and gas. And I gave a statistic this morning about that little area that we've been working near PRL 21. Right. There have been, in that, in that circle I showed on the map, there have been uh, nine exploration wells drilled and seven appraisal wells drilled. Of the nine exploration wells, six have found hydrocarbons. Six have been successful. That's a 66 and two thirds percent success rate almost. And a 100 percent appraisal success rate. That's fantastic. And what it tells you is that if you drill a valid trap with all the necessary ingredients of reservoir, source, charge, and seal, in that part of PNG, you're going to find liquids and gas. So that's the reason we're here. We believe it's a good place to explore. With great terms too. The government provides a lot of incentive for us to be here. What would be your message to the potential developers that they are thinking of coming into the petroleum industry in Papua New Guinea? Uh, look, my message to them is, look, PNG is a really good place to explore. Good geology, particularly for wet gas and dry gas. Uh, it's got good terms. You can make good money here, and uh, there's a, a, a good culture here of exploration and success. The country has gone through the liquids phase of the 1980s, where they went through the Kudabu project and the Gobi project, built them, developed them, and exported the oil. And now we're moving into the hides phase, followed by the elk antelope phase, followed by ours. It's all very positive, and. Uh, if I was looking to invest in a country for oil and gas, this would be the place I'd be coming. Thank you very much, Mr. Schroeder, for your time. Thank you for the invitation. That was a very informative interview with Kingdom Petroleum's Managing Director, Mr. Richard Schroeder. When we return, we shall learn more about social mapping and landowner identification, an essential part of any exploration project. Social mapping and landowner identification is by definition a social science assessment of local customary resource ownership, group formation, identity, and distribution in a project area. That was a definition that was given by the consultant anthropologist Dr. James Wiener. He talks to us about the best approach to social mapping and the history of his work in P&G. Good day viewers. Today we have with us Dr. James Wiener who will talk to us about social mapping. Good evening. Hello. Uh, let, let me first say that um, because of the way that uh, social mapping and landowner identification have been linked by vari in various legislations pertaining to the resource sector in Papua New Guinea, my impression from reading the newspapers, for example, and seeing all the letters that are, that are submitted on the, on the topic, my impression is that your average Papua New Guinea person links social mapping to the task of landowner identification in a resource uh, situation, 
on the idea that landowner uh, identification leads to benefit uh, receipt for those people who uh, are, uh, are benefit uh, recipients according to the legislation. But social mapping is more than that. Social mapping is all about the disposition of a number of different ways of, of dividing and marking up the landscape. And the most obvious one in Papua New Guinea is the landscape in which you find clans, villages, hamlets, households, gardens, various different residences that people use for different subsistence purposes. And that is, of course, one of the primary goals of a social mapping description is to find out that customary uh, way in which people are distributed uh, around their, their own country. But also there are other ways in which Papua New Guinea is divided up. It's divided up into provinces. It's divided up into local uh, level government wards. Uh, these things also now uh, play a part in the way in which people identify themselves and think of themselves locally. So social mapping has to consider um, a number of different ways in which the land is divided and in, in the way these land divisions function to, uh, uh, to order and, and to affect uh, uh, local people's lives. So Dr. Wiener, how long have you been in Papua New Guinea and how has your experience been? Well, I first arrived in 1979 and I went to the Southern Highlands province in the Mubi Valley and I lived in one village for between 1979 and 1989, over three years. And I, uh, during that time, of course, I visited many other parts of PNG, Mount Hagen, Garoka, went out to Milne Bay, was in Port Moresby a, 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 a lot, of course. But in, uh, uh, and then I went on to have an academic career, um, although I kept visiting uh, Papua New Guinea, particularly the village of my, of my original field area. I learned pidgin, and I also learned the language that is spoken in the, in the area in which I did my field, my field work. I, I left academia uh, in 1998, and I became a full-time consultant, although I've maintained a connection to Australian National University, which is where I got my, my PhD. And in 1999, I started working as a consultant for Chevron New Guinea, and I've been working in the, in the Kudubu project area and the Gulf, and then more recently in Central Province for, for Exxon Mobil since 1999. So I've, I've spent a lot of time working as a consultant in, that, uh, in the LNG project area for, for the different companies who have been and who are no longer uh, there um, uh, in, in that project area. Uh, more recently, I've uh, done um, some work uh, environmentally um, in, in Lake Kudabu for oil search. And I've also done some projects on some of the development um, uh, um, projects going ahead in the Fly River. So what's the best way of achieving um, excellence in social mapping? Well, you're talking to an anthropologist. And uh, I lived for over three years in a single village. And in that time, I followed people to their gardens. I took genealogy diagrams for every living soul in the village and also the three neighboring villages in which I was living. I mapped gardens. I mapped sago places. I, I um, mapped uh, routes that people take to hunting territories. And I even did rough maps of where hunting houses were built. But that took me, as I said, over three years. No company or government has the time or the money to, to fund an anthropologist to do a job at that level of detail. Hence, we have to do a job that approximates an, eth an ethnographic portrait of a whole region in a very much shorter period of time. And that calls for skills uh, uh, that will allow the researcher to gather that kind of information far more quickly and to make uh, quicker uh, estimates of, of, the, of the forms of land, land holding, the units of, of customary land ownership, and the social structure in which they acquire meaning. It all has to be done far more quickly than, than is done in ordinary classic anthropological techniques. More on that interview after this break. Do stay tuned. There have been reports that landowners' interests are not protected due to the resource boom. What can be done? 
consultant anthropologist Dr. James Wiener, who spent almost four years with the Hegeso people in Lake Kutubo, gives his expert opinion on this matter. So what are some of the major concerns that the developers and affected communities face during this time? Well, I think the first, uh, the first um, and most uh, important um, thing that, that both developers and uh, project area people uh, consider is, will the social mapping capture everybody who belongs in a benefit delivery uh, forum? Does it, is it going to capture the identity of all the units and all of the individuals who will have to be represented at a, at a benefit forum? The, this is the thing of equal concern to government, developer, and local people. After that, the, the, the description of their customary uh, life and the, and the actual uh, ethnographic description of their social units is somewhat less important. It's, it's making sure that the, uh, the developer knows who are going to be the, who are going to be the benefit deliver, uh, recipients and whether they've been correctly identified. So it seems that the perception that people have now is that um, it, landowners' interests are not properly protected during this resource boom. So could you please share your perspective on this national issue? Yes, I will. Um, first of all, because everyone tends to be focused right from the beginning on the issue of benefit delivery, they, they do not focus on some of the longer term issues. And some of these include impact. And I'm not talking about the direct impact, say, of a large mine or of, a, or of, a, or of oil drilling. I'm talking about long term indirect impact say of road building, which allows um, migrant uh, people from outside the area to come in. It allows foreign species that have not uh, been known of in the local uh, area to come in and be, a, and be pests and, and, and problems to local agriculture. Uh, these things are not easy to foresee because you don't actually know they're going to happen till, till the impact uh, arrives. But the, the idea of long-term and immediate impacts, those things need to be explained to project area people right at the beginning. And, they, and, and, the, and the, the, both the government and the developer needs to start educating people in a proper way that is, a, that is proper to their, to their level of education and comprehension, what they can expect both short and long-term long in terms of impact. To get them focused not just on where they're going to stand in terms of benefit delivery, but how it's going to affect the whole area, both environmentally and socially. So how do you see the importance of community, community affairs? Well, community affairs continues the work that begins with social mapping. Social mapping and landowner identification, I strongly believe, is not a one-off exercise. Community affairs has to continue monitoring the effects of a project on local communities, environmentally, politically, economically, socially, uh, it, it has to prove to the, to the local community that they're not there just to wrest a resource from the ground, but to actually form a meaningful and, and, and fairly long-term relationship with the, with, the, with the local inhabitants who will, after all, bear most of the, in fact, they will bear all of the impact of, of whatever happens in that project. So that, that's the way that I would like to see community affairs um, uh, proceed. In, in any resource sector, whether it be logging, uh, which is, of course, a little bit more short term than, than mining and, and petroleum, but to treat y y the, the relationship with the landowners uh, in a project area as, as something that needs to achieve a, a degree of intimacy and trust and, and, uh, and, um, and cordiality over a long term. And that means taking the task of, of community affairs very seriously updating your census, uh, keeping your, your knowledge of changes in population, uh, alterations uh, in the composition of your landowning, uh, landowning groups, uh, keeping them up to date, and uh, keeping your community affairs staff in the villages and not in the office uh, at the camp. Mm. So is there anything else you'd like to add to what you've already given us? Uh, well, I think what I've uh, said already are large, large issues that I think uh, government, landowners, and, and developers all need to think about carefully. I hope that as a consultant, I contribute to the achievement of, of these goals uh, from the perspective of all three of those parties. That was Dr. James Wiener talking about how landowners' interests can be protected. We shall have more of that after this short break.
Thank you for staying with us. Let us pick up where we left off on that interview with anthropologist Dr. James Wiener. So what's the role of the government in social mapping? Well, uh, let me first start out by saying that I also do an equivalent to social mapping in Australia. Uh, that is, I, uh, I work with Aboriginal communities, Australian Aboriginal communities, as they make applications for the recognition of their customary and traditional rights and interests in land under a piece of legislation in Australia called the Native Title Act. But the Native Title Act is, and the Native, and, uh, uh, is, is quite well resourced by the Australian government. It has set up what we call Native Title representative bodies all around the country. And they are resourced by taxpayer money from the government to uh, pursue and support both with anthropological expertise and legal expertise, the applications for the recognition of native title by indigenous people all around the country. That involves accurate mapping of their, of their native title claim areas, accurate um, description of the, the, the claim group itself and who is in it, and also uh, quite detailed information on how traditional uh, custom has been maintained uh, over, the, over the period um, in any given area of Australia since sovereignty was established. So these are big tasks and they cost a lot of money. The Papua New Guinea government does not have the money to fund these, uh, these kinds of native title, what we call an, or an analog to these native title representative bodies. They put all of the responsibility for funding both social mapping in the first instance and, uh, and the continuing job of community affairs onto the developer themselves. And as a result, there's a constant tension between the developer who does not feel that they are ordinarily have come to Papua New Guinea to take up the task of governance or of being a de facto government. And yet they find that willy nilly they are in that role. And, and of course, they're not suited for it, they don't want to, and they're always trying to put the responsibility for all of these tasks back onto the government. This tension, I believe, will, will exist until the end of the resource boom in Papua New Guinea. There's no way of resolving it. The two are going to be in that state of tension uh, for, the, for the duration. I think some more uh, uh, constructive modus vivendi between them uh, uh, needs to be established. But if you look at the very intricate ways in which benefit delivery is, is uh, built in any given project, there are many, many different benefit streams. Only a tiny fraction goes directly to the landowners in question. Most of it goes in, in various kinds of taxes to the national government, then returns in other kinds of taxes to provincial government. It, 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 it comes back to, to the area, to the region, to the whole country in, 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 different, in different avenues. It, it's, it's very complicated and to be perfectly frank, I think only a, an accountant can, can fully understand it. But um, this is a way in which the developer and the government actually agree as to what, what is going to be the benefit uh, uh, from, a, from any given resource project, and, and more importantly, how it's going to be managed, because some of those income streams can only be managed by the government. Others, the government prefers that the, that the, that the developer do, say for example, a tax credit. They will give the developer a credit on the tax owed from, from the resource if they will undertake a development project such as the building of a road. Now this has occurred on more than one occasion in, in the petroleum project area that I'm familiar with uh, in the Southern Highlands. So that's a common way for the, for the, for the, gov for the government of Papua New Guinea to, to take their tax that they receive from the developer, give it back to them and say, you have the expertise, you have the plant, you have the machinery, you do it and we'll, and we'll in effect pay you out of the tax that you owe us to do that. So that's another way in which that tension between who is responsible for the long-term development uh, of, of, a, of a resource area and, and also of making sure that at the end of the project, that area is going to be better off than it started beforehand, not worse off. So Dr. Weenie, you've talked a lot about um, social mapping and community affairs. So is there a model that can be followed, an ideal model that we could look at to actually go, yeah, this is the project, or this is how we're supposed to do this work? 
Well, I can think of two places right now in, in PNG that are turning out to be models for how, how things should be done. One is, is Lahir Gold, where I think Lahir Gold has taken seriously all the different dimensions of landowner aspirations. Their, their aspirations of political organization and, and, uh, and representation, their, their aspirations for development, their, their aspirations for benefit delivery and for uh, um, uh, compensation for uh, uh, environmental damage. All of these things, the uh, uh, Lahir Gold is taking seriously and is treating as an integrated way of, of relating to the whole population uh, uh, of Lahir Island. The other um, example that I draw attention to is, although it, it had a, a terrible start, the Octeti mine, as a result of the, the court case in Australia that led to a, a, a quite a sizable settlement, for the uh, Octeti uh, um, landowners has created a, 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 a very big a fund of money that's now being administered by such organizations as Octeti Development Foundation and the Papua New Guinea Sustainable Development uh, Project. Now, this money is being used solely to fund well-researched development projects along the Fly River area. OTDF and Octeti Mining have also created a, the, the trust areas and a trust governance structure that actually captures uh, a great deal of the desire of Fly River people to be politically and um, economically represented vis-a-vis -vis the, the company and vis-a-vis -vis their own, own governments. I think there's a lot that, can, that other companies can learn from the, from the way that Octeti learned from its mistakes and the way that Lahir Gold is, is undergoing uh, an integrated approach to its relationship to landowners in the Lahir Gold area. So is there anything else you'd like to add to what you've already given us? Uh, well, I think what I've uh, said already are large, large issues that I think uh, government, landowners, and, and developers all need to think about carefully. I hope that as a consultant, I contribute to the achievement of, of these goals uh, from the perspective of all three of those parties. Thank you very much, Dr. Wiener, for that very insightful conversation um, about social mapping and community affairs. Thank you, Trulo. You pla me how much lo talk talk one time. You pla na all line for Papua New Guinea. Please stay with us. Still on social mapping, we shall have a talk with a former Kiap and district officer, Mr. Chris Warlow, to see how things have changed since independence. Social mapping and landowner identification is a very sensitive and essential part of any exploration project. We spoke with a former KIAP and district officer, Mr. Chris Warlow, about his outlook on this matter. Hello viewers, with me tonight is Chris Warlow, who is a former KIAP and a former district officer. And he's also worked as a consultant with the state of Papua New Guinea um, for regulatory matters. Welcome to the program. Thank you. So tell me, what do you think of the responsibility, how do you view that responsibility of the government in the mining and petroleum sector? Well, I was brought up, I, my work in Papua New Guinea from the Australian uh, administration times until after independence, which stretched over 46 years, has always been with government. And when the proposal was made for 
uh, social mapping and land owner identification. Uh, I was all for that. Uh, it's something I've stated all along uh, ever since uh, my involvement in uh, the Bougainville project and later that one must get a good handle and a grip on landowner issues, who the true owners are, what the improvements are, who has what rights over what areas, uh, before any, any uh, attempt to uh, develop a resource goes ahead. Uh, it was never regulated before. It was done uh, as a uh, requirement, a moral uh, requirement, and also for the convenience of companies who wanted to make sure that they had no uh, people disputing what payments were made uh, over compensation. But as resources became uh, less state-owned in so far as even though the, the laws say they belong to the state, the, the government has abdicated responsibilities to uh, some extent, to my mind, by handing over more and more in the way of royalties and equity to uh, landowners. And so it's not just a matter of compensation now. A few hundred thousand or a few tens of thousands of Kina uh, compensation for a lost house or tree or whatever it might be. It's millions and millions from the actual resource which might be uh, discovered and uh, developed in a very, very small area. And so a lot of that wealth is not going to get to the majority of Papua New Guineans as was required under the Constitution. But obviously to uh, achieve the correct uh, identification, social mapping was required. And so it was written into the uh, new Oil and Gas Act, which replaced the Old Petroleum Act, and the onus, despite my advice to the contrary, to uh, determine uh, land ownership and land rights, uh, the, the onus was put on the, the companies, the foreign companies. Now, I, I don't think it is proper for uh, foreign companies, generally, even though they might be registered in Papua New Guinea, foreign companies to determine uh, who are landowners and what are customary rights in the sovereign, independent state of Papua New Guinea. Uh, it should have been a government uh, responsibility. Um, obviously, uh, the government has to uh, accept the uh, social macro reports and uses them for the uh, uh, business of uh, the uh, forum before development goes ahead. But um, it is the company that is paying and it always leaves the company open to uh, paying the bill, getting the results that it wants from its own consultants. So there should be more government uh, control over the uh, social mapping but the, the, the other issue is, of course, it's in the Act, Section 47 of the Oil and Gas Act, it's a requirement, but the government, after all these years, uh, still as far as I know, hasn't made the regulations. The regulations, which are how to carry out the uh, social mapping, that uh, sets out the nitty-gritty, the workings and the obligations, have never been brought into law by being made a, a, um, a regulation by the Governor-General uh, on the uh, recommendation of uh, advice of cabinet. And so there's still no real legal authority as to accept that thou shalt, the, the company shall do social mapping. The foreign company, the company shall uh, determine who the landowners are and what their rights are and who gets these vast amounts of money if and when some form of development comes along. So that's my main criticism. One, it should be a go more government responsibility and less uh, company responsibility. And two, that uh, the, the government get the regulations in place. It's a simple matter. Thank you very much, Mr. Chris Warlow. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you. That ends another edition of Resource PNG. If you have any queries about the program, do email it through to resourcepng at mtv.com.pg or check MTV online. That's www.mtv.com.pg and go to our Resource PNG page. Until next time, have a pleasant week.